Hey everyone, thanks for watching. I just want to point out that the part about the Iran crisis itself begins at timestamp 10800. Now I got comments on the Argentina video asking me to split off the portion about the war, but I don't want to do that to these videos because the longer videos are longer for a reason. For example, in this case, the main story would be incomplete without the full context provided by the region's history. So I don't encourage it, but if you do want to skip, there's the timestamp. Thanks for watching and enjoy the video. For 40 years, the Cold War often saw local populations used as pawns, with their own wants and desires manipulated to achieve the goals of either America or the Soviet Union. As the mountainous zone near the city of Tabriz changed hands throughout the 18 and 1900s, the ethnically and religiously diverse area found itself part of the great game between major powers, and eventually became part of the ultimate great game, the Cold War. After a short-lived honeymoon effect following the Second World War, it became suddenly crystal clear that the victorious powers no longer considered themselves allies. The games they would play in Tabriz would set the stage for the region's future turmoil, while also making the opening moves of the Cold War. It's the Iran Crisis of 1946. To understand what happened in 1946 and why it happened, we have to go back further to fully look at the history and the ethnic makeup of the region surrounding Tabriz. Most of the region was known as Iranian Azerbaijan and had a majority Azeri population, a Shia Turkic speaking community dominating the Caspian coast, and further inland there was a Kurdish majority along the border with Ottoman Iraq. There were also some pockets of Armenian Christian majorities. The Sunni Kurds and the Christian Armenians were those most hostile to the Persian regime in Tehran. The Azeris certainly had their differences with the ethnic Persians, but at the same time both communities were Shia Muslim and this helped improve relations. In the early 19th century, Persia and Russia engaged in a series of wars over the South Caucasus, they would determine its future boundaries for years to come. Both wars ended in a decisive Russian victory. By the end of February 1828, the Russians had invaded Persia and surrounded their second city of Tabriz. On the 21st, the Russian general Prince Aristov issued an ultimatum to the Persians, demanding their surrender and to sign a peace treaty favoring Russia. During the war, Russia had occupied Christian Armenia, and the treaty demanded the cessation of this territory to the Russian Empire. It also allowed anyone, especially ethnic Russians, living in the areas to be given back, including the city of Tabriz, to simply settle in the new Russian areas of Armenia and leave Iran completely. The treaty also gave the Talish homeland, occupied militarily by Russia during the war, to the Russian Tsardom. Over the next 75 years, the Persian Qajar dynasty, which had the seat of its crown prince in Tabriz, embarked on a program of modernization and, in Tabriz especially, enlightenment thought. By 1900, the Persian population, especially the Azeris and Kurds in the northwest, were fed up with the corruption and hedonism of the Qajar dynasty, and especially that of the sitting Shah, Mozaffar ad-Din, who that year took his first of three trips to Europe on taxpayer dime, paid for by loans from the Russian Empire. By late 1905, the population was feeling the full weight of the foreign debt. Throughout November, street protests took place, many of them by merchants selling in the bazaars of Tabriz and Tehran. About a month later, two Tehran merchants were punished for charging exorbitant prices. They claimed to have charged those high prices due to the high taxes which forced them to give away much of their revenue. The merchants were caned on the feet in public as punishment. The rest of the merchant community in Tehran, Tabriz, and many other cities around Persia was sympathetic to their brethren. Tehran's Shia clerics were also in support of the cause, in line with an agreement they'd made 13 years earlier with the merchants of the city to come together in instances of overreach by the central government. 
This turned into protests in cities across the country in the early days of 1906. And in the Enlightenment-minded, more multi-ethnic Northwest, these took on an almost revolutionary character, with Tabriz being the hotbed for violence among those agitating for reforms. With the Russians having virtually puppetized the Shah's regime, the British opposed the regime through support of the constitutional movement. With British backing, the protests increased in profile and more religious figures got involved. Eventually, the Shah relented and agreed to fire his prime minister and cabinet and submit to some sort of assembly of justice of the people, which would turn out to be a parliament. And although this was not implemented yet, this was still a significant concession from the Shah. Later that year, the Ottoman Empire looked to take advantage of the weakening Persian state by exploiting Kurdish divisions within Persian territory. The Ottomans then used Kurdish troops within their own legions to invade the area and attempted to force the local tribal chiefs to swear allegiance to the Ottoman Sultan. By just a week later, at the end of May, the Ottomans had seized the territory surrounding the city of Urmia and had made another deep advance into Persian-controlled Kurdistan. By the summer, on and off protesting was beginning again in major cities including Tabriz and Tehran. Meanwhile, the Ottomans consolidated their gains in Kurdistan and began occupying and annexing immediately territories that included some areas of majority Farsi-speaking populations as well as majority Azeri areas. In July, another large-scale mass strike took place, again mainly in Tehran, Tabriz, and across the country in cities, this time calling for the election of a Persian parliament. As protesters were constantly getting in day-to-day -day scuffles with the Shah's security forces, for this mass protest, those clergy and merchants demonstrating in Tehran camped out on the sweeping lawns of the British embassy, having faith that Britain would not take action against them given its clandestine support throughout the year. This turned out to be a good gamble, as the British continued to support the constitutional revolutionaries, and the strike continued into August. These Basti, or asylum seekers, maintained their position, camped out at the British Embassy for two weeks. Now, even though a lot of this was going on in Tehran, it's important to remember that many of the forces driving this constitutional push were based in Tabriz. That being said, the Tehran protests swelled to a large enough size to force the Shah's hand. By August 5th, over 12,000 people had joined in the protests on and around the British consulate. In the face of such opposition, and especially in light of their foreign support, the Shah relented and agreed to allow the protesters to write a constitution and open a parliament. After weeks of Persian requests to the Ottoman commanders to get out, the Ottomans stepped up their activities on August 24th, occupying the regional center of Urmia and annexing it and its local lords and chieftains into the Ottoman Empire. However, again, the opposition Kurdish groups not favored by the Turks went to the Russians for help, agreeing to work on behalf of the Tsar to get their local domain back both from their regional rivals and from the Ottomans. The Russians were going to continue to use the monarchy to do business in Iran, as opposed to annexing territory in the way the Ottomans were doing. On September 9th, the election laws were formulated. These laws did exclude several groups, including women, from voting. However, many of the provisions were standard fare of the time. The bigger question about the parliament was whether it would turn into a rubber stamp assembly, like the Russian Duma that Tsar Nicholas II had neutralized, but at this point, the Shah, having given in, allowed the opposition leaders significant input in writing the constitution. Finally, on October 7th, the Shah opened the parliament, a day most of its members hoped would mark the end of the turmoil. After all, this was a historic day in the history of Persia. For the first time, an elected body was in place alongside the Shah. The body reviewed the rest of the constitution, made minor changes, including adding a second house of parliament, and then had it approved by the Shah, who enacted the constitution on December 30th, 1906. The parliamentarian's revolutionary tricolor, with its specifically defined unique shape and specifically defined pale colors, became the new state flag.
However, Mozaffar ad-Din shockingly passed away on January 3rd, 1907. As weak as he had been in the face of the European powers, he'd managed to hold the country together and his well-timed compromise got the striking merchants back to work, bringing the turmoil to a close in a constructive manner. Now everything was up in the air. The heir to the throne was the crown prince, Muhammad Ali Qajar, and although by tradition he lived in Tabriz, he did not agree with the relatively progressive views of the multi-ethnic city. This despite the fact that the House of Qajar was of Turkic origin. Remember that the constitutional movement did include Persians and was mainly driven by the merchant and clerical classes, certainly led by that of Tabriz and other northern cities, but also to an extent in Tehran itself, the home of the parliament. The new Shah received his coronation on January 21st, 1907. Remember, when we speak of Turkic origin, we're mainly talking about a Turkic Shia population in Persia, such as the Qajar dynasty or the Azeri population. However, the Ottoman Turks were Sunni, and in fact, they proclaimed to be the only legitimate Sunni caliphate in the world, with the Ottoman Sultan proclaimed to be the head of all Sunni Islam. This is why, as they saw themselves and Persia weakening, the Ottoman Empire decided to strengthen its position in Persia by claiming the sovereignty over the Iranian Kurds. The Ottomans expanded their presence in the first week of August. They now added the excuse that this land only became part of Persia in an 1821 war, and that the Ottoman take-back of all of Kurdistan was payback. Of the external players in Persia, Britain was in the weakest position. It was supporting the Tabriz revolutionaries, while opposing both the Russians who backed the Shah, and the Ottomans who were encroaching on the Tabriz corridor, where much of the British-backed movement was based. East. Ultimately, the British decided that the Ottoman Empire was the bigger threat. The British went to St. Petersburg to sign a convention at the end of August. This ended the half-century-long rivalry between the British and Russian empires, and brought Russia and Britain in line against the Ottoman Empire. The convention was the result of a compromise, in which both Russia and Britain would support the Shah's government, and granting the Shah unimpeded rule over the center portion of the country. However, the Russians were given domain over most of the affairs of the north and northwest part of the country, while the British exerted a sphere of influence over the southern portion of the Shah's realm. This, of course, meant resource rights, although no oil was discovered yet, and the ability to use their army in those areas should the need arise. The same day, without the knowledge of the pact yet, Prime Minister Mirza Ali Ashgar was assassinated outside the parliament building. Ali Ashgar had made himself many enemies in the country, but he had a good reputation for getting things done and had been invited back by the Shah in the wake of the constitutional crisis. He'd already made progress in negotiations with the Ottomans at the time of his death, and even after his death, they ceased their advance. However, this left an opening for the Shah to appoint a new loyalist to the post of Prime Minister. The Parliament was able to oust his nominee within a month, and get the Shah to nominate their choice for the post on October 27th. On November 12th, the Parliament forced the Shah to swear allegiance to the Parliament body and declared that the people and Parliament granted the Shah's legitimacy. However, the Constitutionalists were in for a rude surprise. Now that the British were no longer backing them, the Shah had a free hand to deal with them however he liked. Well, it turned out the new Shah did not like this parliament. The monarch summoned his ministers on December 17th, allegedly for a special meeting of cabinet. However, when they showed up, the Shah ordered their arrest. The entire cabinet was detained, although the prime minister, Nasir al-Mulk, was set free after a short while. His government, however, was done, and the Shah himself appointed an entirely new cabinet, made up mainly of his loyalists. And while keeping the parliament's three colors, the Shah changed the flag to a design more resembling traditional Qajar flags. 
Meanwhile, rebels backing the parliament had taken over half of the city of Tehran. Tabriz and Rasht in the north sent reinforcements to help. However, these and the initial uprising were crushed on December 22nd by the Shah's forces. In the northwest, the Ottomans took advantage of the dysfunction to seize more territory. The Shah declared the constitution to be null and void. He claimed it to be contrary to Islamic law, which gave the ruling family the right to the throne that they had won centuries earlier. The Shah attempted to dissolve the parliament, but for now it remained intact, although neutered by the Shah's authoritarian tendencies. Meanwhile, the need for security for the Shah grew as an attempt on his life was made in February 1908. Throughout the early part of 1908, the Shah's court began to bribe the Cossack brigades with the promise of total control over the city of Tehran. Meanwhile, the parliament and the merchants simply saw the Cossacks as another agent of Russian influence in the country. By the summer, the Cossacks were sufficiently loyal for the Shah to launch another attack on the already weakened parliament. The Cossack brigades under the command of Vladimir Lyakov instituted a siege of the parliament building shelling it from all sides, executing parliamentary leaders, and then entering the remains of the defeated parliament building to burn and plunder it. As promised, the Cossacks now took full control over the capital region. Meanwhile, Tabriz simmered, with the constitutionalists unable to do anything for the moment. The Shah set up a military and economic blockade of Tabriz as an extra precaution. By February of the next year, the city had become a magnet for constitutional revolutionary fighters. The revolutionaries also swamped the city of Rasht along the Caspian coast. Both cities became hotbeds of insurrectionary activity with Tabriz being kept under the closest supervision from the Shah's troops, from the Persian Cossacks, and from the Russian Cossacks in Russian Empire, who had their eye on securing the Shah's power in Persia. The Russians did, however, attempt to mediate between both sides to end the turmoil. The parliament attempted to assert its control over the budget, and it reached out to hire American financier William Schuster. Schuster was appointed Persia's treasurer general and attempted to support the revolutionaries through his financial policies. Thus, he drew the ire of not only the Shah, but also of Britain and Russia, who were concerned that Schuster's presence was helping to undermine the Shah's authority. The Russians pressured Persia to quell the revolutionaries and get Schuster out. The Shah sent Muhammad Vali Kalatbari Tonakabani, an ethnic Persian nobleman, to lead the Persian forces around Tabriz and crush the rebellion by whatever means necessary. However, when he got to Tabriz, the Kalatbari prince sympathized with the revolutionaries. He refused to fight the constitutional forces, saying that to do so would be to start a civil war and would be considered fratricide. So instead, he rallied the rebel forces to his cause, and in March became their leader. If there was going to be fratricide in Persia, he wanted to be on the side of the people. This in itself amounted to a bit of a declaration of civil war, as the revolutionaries attempted to begin not only building their army, but recruiting the Shah's soldiers onto their side. Once they had enough men, they took control of the city administrations of both Tabriz and Rasht, expelling the Shah's representatives as the blockades of both cities by the government continued. However, these blockades were now effectively sieges, with the constitutional forces having seized the government in both cities, effectively creating a rival government. And once again, this was not along ethnic lines, as many Azeris, some of whom shared bloodlines with the Qajar dynasty, were part of the revolutionaries, yet their goal was not Azeri separatism, and many Persians were participating as well, along with Kurds. Their goal was a new Persian state, not a separate Azeri state. None of those distinctions really mattered to the Russians. All they saw was that the Shah had failed embarrassingly to quell the uprising, and in fact had watched the Shah's representatives switch sides and turn the protesters into revolutionaries. This could not have been seen as a bigger failure by the Russians, and they were now out of patience with the Shah's regime. Another American in Persia at the time, missionary Howard Baskerville, who was in Tabriz, 
was killed by artillery fire from the Shah's troops on April 19th. Baskerville, who was only 24 when he died fighting alongside the constitutional revolutionaries, is still revered as a patriot of democracy by Iranians even today. Baskerville's legacy was invoked even during the 1979 Islamic Revolution by Iranians attempting to demonstrate the type of American foreign policy they wanted to have back, as opposed to the one they perceived existed in 1979. Russia, of course, had been granted the right to act in northern Iran in the 1907 convention with Britain. Russia decided to exercise these rights. The Russians invaded Persia from the north with the intent to occupy Tabriz and possibly Rasht. The plan for what to do after the occupation was also not set in stone. All St. Petersburg knew was that they wanted Russian troops in Tabriz and as fast as possible. On April 29th, the Russians under General Snarsky occupied Tabriz. Remember, the Russians had jurisdiction over everything that happened in northern Iran under the 1907 agreement with Britain. Thus, they decided to keep their troops in control of northwest Persia as a bulwark against the Ottomans, and also as a potential jumping-off point for future operations within Persia. By July 9th, the parliamentary armies of Satar Khan and Bakar Khan had met up, and the Persian constitutional government was threatening Tehran. The Russians again took matters into their own hands and threatened the revolutionaries with the introduction of more Russian troops. Those troops began arriving from Baku the next day with the intent of occupying Gilan and starving the revolutionaries of another home base. However, this would have little bearing on the outcome of the final showdown between the revolutionaries and the Shah's army in Tehran. General Lyakov had now taken personal control of the Cossack brigades and commanded on behalf of the Shah's government. Meanwhile, the combined forces of Satar Khan and Bakir Khan were led by the Kalatbari prince, who refused the Russians' ultimatum and proceeded with the siege of Tehran. By the 13th, although the Russians had captured much of their home base by the Caspian Sea, the revolutionaries had taken control of Tehran and forced the Shah's troops to surrender. Lyakov, meanwhile, hid along with loyalists in the Russian embassy in Tehran and wouldn't officially surrender for another two months. By July 16th, the battle was over. The constitutionalists had won, and they had put the Shah's son, the 11-year-old crown prince, Ahmad of Qajar, on the throne under a parliament-approved regency. His father, meanwhile, was deposed and took refuge on the 17th at the Russian embassy, where he was granted asylum. For now, Muhammad Ali of Qajar vacated the throne and headed for Odessa, but he wouldn't stay out of the picture forever. The Kalatbari prince would go on to be a national hero, immortalized under the title Sepadar Azam. The prince had already been the richest man in Persia prior to the revolution, and now he had the popularity to go with it, although he would later suffer a humiliating falling out with the future Pahlavi dynasty. It was nothing but a blip on the radar for his legacy. Jumping back to April, the Anglo-Persian Oil Company had been formed to take advantage of oil deposits discovered in the southern part of the country, in the British area of influence. No oil discoveries had as of yet been made within the Russian sphere in the northern part of the country. Oil was destined to play a huge role in the future of international relations within Persia. Meanwhile, a new true constitutionalism began to take hold in Persia, with the child king having very little authority and for the first time the parliament having a large say over the running of the country. However, the state they ruled over was a broken-down empire riddled with foreign occupation and domestic strife. The young shah's father knew this, and so did the Russians who wanted to bolster the Persian state by clandestinely supporting the young shah's father's attempt to win the throne back. However, as opposed to bolstering the Persian state, this was effectively tearing down the current Persian state, just as the revolutionaries had done to Muhammad Ali's regime the first time. In the summer of 1911, the ex-Shah returned at the head of an army of loyalists, with the intention of overthrowing the Kalatbari prince, William Schuster, and his son, who was playing the role of collaborationist against him. During this crisis, the Kalatbari prince had to resign as prime minister. He was then replaced within the cabinet of the constitutionalist government by the prince of Bakhtiari. 
the pretenders' forces were driven back, away from Tehran, over the course of the late summer. And eventually, the ex-Shah would surrender to his old government on October 8th. However, he fled back to Russia and continued his exile in Odessa before eventually ending up in Italy. Meanwhile, the Russians, who had been planning on recognizing his new government, now turned to the existing Tehran regime and presented it with a stark ultimatum. The Russians demanded that the Persians revoke Schuster's tax collection law and suspend the use of the gendarme to collect those taxes. In addition, they required Persia to issue a formal apology from the parliament to Russia and to its consulates in Tehran and Tabriz. This was seen as a set of outrageous demands in Persia. After two weeks without a response, the Russians severed diplomatic ties with Persia on November 18th. Five days after that, the Persians did comply with the original ultimatum. However, the Russians were not satisfied, and they issued another ultimatum on November 29th. This presented the explicit demand to dismiss Schuster and evict him from Persia, and to immediately replace Schuster's gendarme units with Russian-friendly Persian Cossacks. It didn't take long this time for the parliament to reject this new set of demands. However, the Russians were not making empty threats. On December 19th, troops began pouring across the border, expanding the Russian military zone around Tabriz to include Persian Kurdistan and other parts of northwestern Persia. The Russians did take the opportunity to kick the Ottomans out of Kurdistan where they found them. However, the Persian border they restored was only for future use because for now the Russian military occupied and administered that territory just the same as the rest of northwestern Persia. On the 21st, resistance began in Tabriz, a city that had been occupied now for several years, and the local forces briefly managed to expel the Russians from the city as they focused their advance elsewhere in the region. The Russians decided to continue their advance around the rebel stronghold and then exert any revenge they wanted to later when returning to mop up. With the Persian state in total crisis, and with the possibility of outright Russian invasion of the capital looming, the parliament resigned on December 24th. Or more accurately, it was dissolved by the cabinet with the hope that this would hold off further Russian advances. However, the appeasement tactic didn't work, and so the cabinet went further, ousting Schuster from the country on January 11th. The American was replaced by a Belgian director of finance, while the Persian cabinet reluctantly signed the November 29th ultimatum, having now fulfilled its terms. However, on the same day, the Russians retook Tabriz, with brutal reprisals and other violent acts set upon the population by the Russian troops. They massacred civilians, raped women, destroyed buildings, and left decapitated bodies hanging from lampposts as a sign to all who may resist Russian rule. As the city of Rasht came under the same administration as Tabriz, it was also subject to vicious reprisals from the Russians. The Persian cabinet's capitulation to Russia had been too little too late, and the Russians punished the Persian government as well, murdering several Persian policemen during reprisals in Rasht. Just over two years later, Europe was embroiled in the early stages of World War I. On August 1, 1914, Russia became involved as Germany declared war on Russia back in Europe. As the men went marching towards Europe's conflagration, what was happening in Persia became of secondary importance. However, it didn't take long for the South Caucasus to become a vitally important region. On November 1st, the Ottoman Empire entered World War I, on the opposite side of the British and Russians. That placed the Ottoman Empire at odds with Russia, Britain, and their Persian clients. In a lot of ways, this was just a continuation within a world war context of the rivalry that had already been going on for years over the South Caucasus and Persia. But now, despite Persia's neutrality, the great powers weren't just going to use the area to skirmish, they were going to use it to battle. Tabriz figured to feature prominently in the campaign in Persia. Ottoman Minister of War Enver Pasha made Tabriz the first goal of the Ottoman advance in Persia. However, Russia had their own target, and they had their sights set on the Ottoman city of Van. The Russians made the first move on December 10th, 
But the Ottomans hit back, initiating a series of offensives and counteroffensives between the two powers, trading Tabriz and Van on several different occasions. Now, Persia was officially neutral, however, they were receiving support from the Germans. Large segments of the legislature were pro-German, as the Persians had experienced so much trouble in recent years with the British and Russians. The Shah's gendarme units, pro-German and armed by Ottoman forces, began to strike back at the Russian occupiers, taking back swathes of Russian military territory. Within two weeks, the Russians had returned and occupied Tehran, with the British also invading Persia from the east. The pro-German members of the parliament fled Tehran and formed their own government in southwestern Iran under the protection of the Ottoman army. Meanwhile, the Russians returned some of the territory, including Tehran, back to the Shah, but still retained an occupation force in Tehran and points west, with the British occupying non-military controlled Persia to the east of Tehran. However, we only see the Russian forces because we're talking about Russia throughout this episode. But if we were talking about Britain, we would see some little blue dots to the right of Tehran. And if we were talking about the Ottoman Empire, we would see some little red dots in the rebel Persian state. However, within a year, the situation had changed drastically again. The Ottomans and pro-German Persian forces had recaptured much of Gilan and the Caspian coast. Again, the Russians had to withdraw, so the British temporarily took over protection of the Shah. However, they didn't have the forces to do that, so the Shah was left mostly unprotected. Meanwhile, the Russians were beginning to land troops, and within a month, they were steadily approaching the capital. As the Russian forces bared down on Tehran, the remaining pro-German members of the parliament, who had not fled to the rebel government, proclaimed a coup against the Shah, who was forced to flee to the Russian consulate in the city. Meanwhile, the British had very little to no presence in the area and could do nothing to stop the coup, with the British who were present in Tehran also awaiting the arrival of the Russian army. The next day, the Russians entered Tehran and rescued the Shah, with the remaining pro German parliamentarians having fled to the rival government. However, within four months, another Ottoman and Persian nationalist offensive had recaptured Gilan for the Central Powers. While Tehran was given another round of impotent British protection, the entire story was about to be flipped on its head back in European Russia. The February Revolution broke out in European Russia. It was February on the Gregorian calendar, which Russia still used at that point. The Tsar, Nicholas II, was cast off the imperial throne. His brother then abdicated the position, leaving the monarchy vacant and a provisional government under Alexander Kerensky was declared. The Russian monarchy was not officially abolished at this point, and royal family members continued in their military service, as the provisional government was not backing away from the war, despite the fact that the Tsar's abdication had largely been caused by the war. However, in late April, members of the royal family were removed from their posts, and many Cossacks also started abandoning their positions. The Russians consulted with the British for support, but they couldn't spare much. Later that year, the British and Russians met with Kurdish tribal leaders within the rebellious Persian state in hopes of enlisting their support against the occupying Ottoman forces. On September 14th, the Russian monarchy was officially abolished and the provisional government was renamed to a republic still under Alexander Kerensky's leadership. The war was increasingly unpopular and there were fewer and fewer troops to fight it as the royals, the Cossacks, and numerous other factions had abandoned the Russian army. The Ottomans' own weakness was the only thing keeping Russia in control of northwestern Persia and the Caucasus. However, chaos soon erupted in early November, October on the then Russian calendar, as the October Revolution took over European Russia. Communist rebels, under the leadership of Vladimir Lenin's Bolshevik faction, seized control of the Russian heartland. With Lenin's communist government now in control of Moscow, the so-called bourgeois Russian Republic under Kerensky remained in control of the Caucasus region and the occupied areas at this point. But just four days later, a drastic shakeup began. 
under Russian leadership, the Azerbaijani, Armenian, and Georgian delegations to the Russian parliament declared their own commissariat autonomous from the Russian Republic. Now, at this point, they weren't officially ruling out reuniting with Russia in the future, but that didn't stop the move from helping to propel the Russian weakness in the region. Within a month, the Russian forces within Persia had mostly disintegrated, and those that remained were merged with those in Anatolia to form the forces of Western Armenia. Meanwhile, they officially handed control of northwest Persia and Tabriz back to the Shah's regime. However, the Shah had little practical control over the area due to being cut off by the Central Powers-aligned Persian state. The Russians cling to a presence across the Caspian Sea, while the Transcaucasians took temporary control of an Azeri-populated section of Persia. This was spurred on by the Azeri component within Transcaucasia, and this protective action for the locals was designed to be temporary in wake of the Russian evacuation. However, the Shah got some help from the British, who managed to push from their base in Iraq all the way up to Rasht on the Caspian coast. This was done by the Dunster Force, sent under General Dunsterville to try to gather support from both the Persian and Russian Cossacks, plus other factions that had been fighting alongside the Russians but had now laid down their arms. Dunsterville's force met resistance from the local communes that had taken power in rebel Persia, following their former Ottoman allies being driven west by the British. Meanwhile, communists were seizing power further up the coast. However, not communists from Moscow. Instead, Armenian communists seized control of Baku. After a multi-day struggle, they massacred the Azeri citizens and gendarmes alike. Meanwhile, the British and Russians were on their way to assist in the fight. However, the commune would persist. Despite several ceasefires between multiple different Russian governments, other governments in the region, and the Ottoman Empire, the Ottomans began an offensive toward the Caspian, retaking Vaughn once again, but now it was in the context of the Armenian genocide going on throughout the Ottoman regions. In the Armenian population of Vaughn, which had held out for several years and survived the city changing hands multiple times, were now massacred by the Ottoman troops. So we're starting to see massacres occur on multiple different sides, from Christians, from Muslims, from communists. And the map is starting to look like a jigsaw puzzle. Across the Caspian, the Soviets failed to secure Bukhara, but they were able to get control of Kiva and the Caspian coast. This allowed increased support for Baku, who the next day completed their exodus of the Azeris and declared victory for the commune. At the same time, the Bolsheviks sent Cheka and other agents across the Caspian to take control of the commune and end the wild executions going on in Baku. The Red Army of Baku also engaged in an offensive. By the 16th of April, they had seized Lankaran, essentially making it an exclave of the Baku communists. On April 22nd, Transcaucasia ruled out Russia being a part of its future, disavowing both the Soviets, as they always had, but also the White Army's Russian Republic. Transcaucasia tabled the idea of reuniting in the future and became a federation of the national committees of the three constituent peoples. Meanwhile, the Ottoman Empire was setting out to gather an army to capture Baku. They wanted local Azeris who felt alienated by the Baku commune and the slaughter of their comrades to take up arms against both the Armenian communists and the British, as well as potentially the red and white armies. 5,000 alienated Azeris joined the force to go with 5,000 regular Ottoman troops. Meanwhile, General Dunsterville was busy rallying support for his potential offensive. The British wanted Dunsterville to defend Baku against the inevitable Ottoman assault. Dunsterville was also working with Cossacks and White Army staff, who some of the time posed as communists to help Dunsterville's cause. In Transcaucasia, the Georgians now took German support and declared their independence on the 26th. The Georgians had done a lot to keep the Federation together and to keep the Azeris and Armenians from fighting one another. Now with the Ottomans and Bolsheviks each splitting the Azeris and Armenians against each other, there was no way to keep the Union together. 
Two days later, Armenia and Azerbaijan proclaimed their independence. By June 5th, the Ottoman troops had arrived in Azerbaijan and were assaulting Baku, but the city's defenders held out. The Georgians were also participating in this offensive as they were aligned with the Germans. The Ottomans turned their attention south to Tabriz. The army of the Caucasus seized Tabriz on June 8th, and a few days later had the remaining Cossacks in the area on the run. By June 17th, they had captured Urmia, and the Ottomans once again annexed the territory of this part of Kurdistan. The Ottomans now had a land bridge to Baku, and another assault seemed inevitable. Unbeknownst to the Ottomans, the Bolsheviks were bolstering the commune in Baku, and the Baku Red Army went on an offensive June 25th. The communists had the army of the Caucasus on the retreat, and the commune was able to seize a sizable hinterland. But within a month, the white army had retaken Kiva on the other side of the Caspian, cutting off Bolshevik support for the commune. On July 25th, the commune government voted to request British aid, so the socialist commissars resigned. The proletarian committee of dictators under the Bolsheviks was now replaced by a bourgeois cabinet of five dictators, with the Baku government renamed the Central Caspian Dictatorship. Meanwhile, the Dunster force was now all ready to go, marching into northwestern Persia and retaking Urmia on the 28th of July. However, it was only a few days later when the Ottomans began their full offensive towards ultimately capturing Baku. On July 31st, they retook Urmia. In response to the advance, the British deployed their Cossack allies, setting them up in the so-called Provisional Military Dictatorship of Mugan. This is where the Russian forces would be based in the upcoming fight against the Ottomans, while the British would be based in Baku. By August 27th, the Ottomans and company had surrounded Baku. Meanwhile, the British had subdued Mirza Kuchik Khan's government, which had been swaying between the Ottomans and the Soviets, depending on who was stronger. The Ottomans and their allies began the shelling of Baku, which continued all the way through September 12th, as the Ottomans tightened their grip around the city. The British, not wanting to get into a losing battle, wanted to leave. However, Baku convinced them to stay, with Dunsterville's force remaining until all hope was lost. However, on September 13th, the Ottomans began the final offensive, and the next day, defeat was imminent, and the British and their Russian allies fled the city, abandoning it to Ottomans. Ottoman and Azerbaijani control. The Christians and communists who made up most of the Armenian population of the city was massacred on the streets as payback for the genocide of Azeris back in March under the communist dictatorship. While this took place alongside the simultaneous Armenian genocide, these particular actions were more Azerbaijani revenge for what had happened in March. And of course, the Turks were only too happy to play along at this point. The Azeris then went to war with Armenia on their western flank. With Ottoman help, they took half the Republic of Armenia, the region called Nakhichevan after its princes. However, the Christian Armenians pushed out the Azeris by October 17th, as the Ottomans were engaged in fierce fighting and no longer had troops to spare. The Ottomans themselves were under grave threat by the end of the month, and on October 30th, the Ottomans signed the Armistice of Mudros, ending the fighting. This armistice saw the British and Ottomans abandon their occupied territories and reset Set the Persian Ottoman border to where it had been prior to World War I. The Qajar dynasty, despite being now just little more than a figurehead, regained control over northwest Persia. Two days later, Azerbaijan renounced its relationship with the defeated Ottomans, yet the Azeris were going about other methods of accomplishing their goals. They had allies in Nakhichevan set up a puppet republic known as the Aras Republic, nominally independent but again a puppet of Azerbaijan. With Armenia threatening to invade Aras, by January 27th, the Azeris had secured the republic with military force while still letting it remain independent. Meanwhile, on the Caspian coast, a rebellion sprang up against Cossack forces who had tried reorganizing their control of the area into a civil territorial administration. However, it was still subject to the overthrow on April 25th. A Soviet government was declared in its place. 
This remained the status quo through the early summer. However, by July 30th, Armenia had taken back Nakhichevan, and Soviet Lankaran had changed its name to the Mugan Soviet Republic. However, on this day, the Azeris invaded, and on the 31st, captured Lankaran. By February of the next year, Soviet Russia was back in control of the Eastern Caspian. On the 16th, British forces, which had been bolstering the Shah's government after the surrender of the Ottomans, left Persia. But just like the Russians, the British wouldn't be gone forever. On April 9th, the Sheikh Mohammed Kiabani, an intellectual cleric in the typical Tabriz mold, proclaimed the city and its surrounds to be a, quote, land of liberty. And while not a separatist from the Persian nation, this was in opposition to the Shah's government. His forces confirmed the state of Azadistan, or Liberty Land, on April 9th. By the 22nd, the Soviet Russians were on the move, and they were advancing on Georgia and Azerbaijan. Already with control of the Caspian Sea, the Soviets chose to attack Azerbaijan, and within a week they had swept through the country and seized Baku. On the same day, the 28th, the Bolsheviks handed over the territory to the communist puppet government. By May 1st, the Soviets had conquered Azerbaijan, and now had their firmest foothold yet in the southeastern Caucasus. With the Red Navy now able to base out of Baku, the non-communist Russian Republic's fleet, anchored at the British base at the Persian city of Anzali, was now under direct threat from communist attack, and the Soviets sunk the remaining Russian Republic vessels in a raid on May 18th, allowing Mirza Kuchik Khan and his factions to retake power, this time with Soviet Russian support. As such, Mirza Kuchik Khan declared a socialist republic, with its capital in Rasht, and the intention to expand the revolution to all of Persia. However, Kuchik Khan was not really a communist, and while his grassroots Jengali fighters were appreciated by the Soviets, their allies in Arasht pushed for a coup against Kuchik Khan. On June 9th, the coup occurred, and the relatively moderate regime of Kuchik Khan was replaced by a hardline communist program set up by the more pro-Soviet members of the Rasht government. In July, the Red Army, trying to get in the good graces of the Azeris, prepared for an attack on Armenia with the intent to seize Naki Shevan for the Azerbaijanis. The Soviet troops delivered their reward to their new clients and within a week handed over control to the local communists. The Azeris got the Zangazir Mountains in the middle, and for the time being, Soviet Naki Shevan was separate from Soviet Azerbaijan. On September 7th, the Shah sent loyal Cossacks, along with regional fighters loyal to his vassals, in an attempt to retake Tabriz. By the 13th, Tehran had reasserted control over Tabriz. Meanwhile, the Armenians were in the unenvious position of being enemies with both the Turks and the Soviets in their satellites. On November 28th, the Turks invaded from the west, and more genocidal killing of Armenian civilians began in one of the final phases of the Armenian Genocide. The communists, certainly known for their own violent outbursts, exploded west to meet the Turks, and the Armenian government was forced to flee into exile. The Soviets had already installed the local Armenian communists in power, and were going to force them to play nice by now essentially posing as a triple agent, saying they would help the Armenians recover Nakhichevan, a promise that ended up unfulfilled as Lenin didn't support it. However, the Red Army field commanders were willing to tell their men whatever they needed to get them to fight for the Red cause. The Soviet Russians and the Turks did not engage in hostilities, and the situation remained largely the same by February of the next year. However, on the 11th, a Red Army force led by Joseph Stalin as political commissar invaded the future leader's homeland of Georgia. However, the Soviet Russians were just gearing up for the main assault, along with getting the Georgian Bolsheviks on their side, when major happenings in Persia took the spotlight in the region. By this point, Shah Ahmad was mainly a powerless figurehead, and the House of Qajar wielded very little real influence over the country. Regional clerics and nobles ruled much of the territory that the Shah purported to control, in addition to the swathes of territory, although now reduced, that he did not control. As of this point, that included not only Gilan, as we see on this map, but also several other areas of the country. 
In command of the Persian Cossack Brigade in Tabriz was Colonel Reza Pahlavi. The British managed to gain influence over Pahlavi, leading them to encourage him, with British logistical support, to march Cossacks to Tehran for potential action against the Shah. Pahlavi seized his opportunity, and his army surrounded Tehran. On the 21st, they entered the city. Only the police garrisons in the city center loyal to the Shah fought back, as very few were willing to spill blood for the Shah, who was seen as incompetent and spoiled. Pahlavi demanded that he be made Minister of War and that his ally in the parliament be named Prime Minister. The British now wanted Pahlavi to bring most of the country under his influence, including seizing back Gilan. The Soviets, seeing less and less potential in Gilan and Persia, now sent the Red Army, some of which was commanded by Stalin, to invade the rest of Georgia. Within two days, the Man of Steel had his homeland secured and on the 25th transferred control to the local communists. The Soviets had to clean up their loose ends in Persia, signing a treaty of friendship on February 26th, which gave up any Soviet Russian support for the Jengali communists in Gilan. On March 16th, the expected treaty between Turkey and Soviet Russia was signed, ending the now and again battles between them. Later in the year, the Treaty of Kars was signed between Turkey and the other Soviet republics in the region, formalizing their borders with Turkey. This included Soviet Nakhichevan coming under the control of Soviet Azerbaijan. Most of this policy was dictated from Moscow to the various red factions, as they were essentially puppet states of Soviet Russia. The Azeris had to give back the Zangazur Mountains and some land to the east, while keeping both Nakhichevan and Nagorno-Karabakh. Nakhichevan didn't send a representative by order from Moscow, as was the Azerbaijani ceding of the Zangazur Mountains in areas to the east. With the agreement between Tehran and Moscow that the Soviets would not support Gilan, Reza Khan Pahlavi took an army to Rasht and invaded. Pahlavi was also rebuilding the Persian army, and without Soviet Russian support, the Soviet Persians had no chance. By March of the next year, the Red Army no longer occupied its Caucasus puppet states, and for the first time in about 15 or 20 years, a relative peace came over the Southeast Caucasus. On the 12th, at the direction of Moscow, Soviet Georgia, Soviet Armenia, and Soviet Azerbaijan combined into the Soviet Transcaucasian Republic. However, this was just a precedent of consolidation for the December 30th signing of the Treaty on the Creation of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, colloquially, of course, known as the Soviet Union. This was effectively a new Russian empire on the northern border of Persia, and now a communist empire to boot, one that threatened the excesses of the Shah's lifestyle. In fact, the Pahlavi coup had not just rendered the Shah powerless, but Ahmad of Qajar was so scared he fled the country, taking a quote-unquote European tour. With the state now a kingdom without a king, Reza Khan Pahlavi continued his mission to stamp out separatism in the country. As Sheikh Khazal al-Kabi proclaimed his independence in October, October, Pahlavi planned to crush him with Persia's slowly increasing forces. On January 21st of the next year, Vladimir Lenin died, and this new Russian empire that Persia was just getting used to living next to became a big question mark. Stalin, now the general secretary of the Soviet communists, made sure the question mark didn't last very long. On November 1st, the British began to doubt Pahlavi and began to consider that it might be better for Sheikh Khazal to conquer Tehran and re-establish Persia under his leadership. At the very least, they hoped to limit the power of Pahlavi within the country, for his power within Persia had increased increased rapidly following the Shah's departure, and Pahlavi, a dictator at this point, but a civilian nonetheless, began to have the styling His Serene Highness applied to his cabinet position. This, of course, is a style more generally applied to royals. Pahlavi made his case as much to the British as he did to his own people by crushing the Arabistan uprising, a few months later arresting Sheikh Khazal as he cruised on his yacht. On October 28th of that year, the exile of Shah Ahmad was made permanent, and the Qajar dynasty was officially stripped of the Persian throne. Now, instead of a kingdom without a king, it was a de facto republic. Even Reza Khan himself admitted that. However, nobody proclaimed the state a republic, and the British instead encouraged the election of Reza Khan as the new Shah. On December 12th, he was elected, and three days later officially began his rule, establishing the Pahlavi dynasty dissolving the Qajar sublime state and replacing it with the new Pahlavi imperial state. On the morning of April 25th, 
the massive coronation ceremony for Reza Khan began. The ceremony marked the first change in Iranian dynasties in hundreds of years. However, the new Shah quickly began attempting to break his country off of the British and Soviet influence. In 1931, he revoked the exclusive rights for the Anglo-Iranian oil company to drill for oil in Iran. While he didn't nationalize the company, he did open up the oil industry to Persian companies. The Shah also dropped the revolutionary colors, although he kept the unique shape of the state's flag, and in late 1934, his foreign ministry requested that the English language name of his country be changed to Iran, Iran meaning land of the Aryans in Farsi. So on March 21st, 1935, the Imperial State of Persia officially became the Imperial State of Iran in all languages. However, within five years, the Second World War had kicked off in Europe. As of yet, none of the local countries were involved in the conflict. Persia continued its ties with Germany and nationalized some more British companies. Although at this point, the Shah held off on further messing with the Anglo-Iranian oil company. On June 22, 1941, the Soviet Union became involved in the war as Germany invaded, forcing the Soviets and the British to once again work together. This was turning into a movie that Iran had certainly seen before. On August 1st, the Shah received an offer from Germany to stay neutral in World War II in return for the most modern steelwork the Germans had. Reza Shah had heavily invested in the modernization of Iran as part of the legitimizing of his rule. Plus, the Shah didn't exactly need too much persuasion to stay neutral. On August 17th, the British and Soviets presented an ultimatum to the Shah to remove all German nationals from Iran. Iran had become a vital supply route to the Soviet Union. The British had a major presence in Iraq, although they no longer controlled the country outright, and had bases in the country which would have easily allowed them to supply the Soviet Union through Tabriz. Plus, if the British were able to secure use of all of Iran, they could then also use the network of roads from Tehran through Tabriz to reach the Soviet Union from that direction. On August 25th, the Soviets invaded the country from the north, while the British assaulted from the south. The next day, the Soviets captured Tabriz. The Soviets tightly controlled the flow of information in and out of their occupied territory, attempting to use propaganda to portray a glorious Soviet image and in Tabriz specifically create fertile grounds for separatism. By the 30th, the British and the Soviets had met up and the two armies were bearing down on Tehran. Various Persian units began to surrender, including several top generals. When the Shah found out his military commander had surrendered to the British and Soviets, the Shah beat him over the head with a cane and then nearly shot him until his son Mohammad Reza convinced him to back down and arrest the general instead. Meanwhile, the British and Soviets were getting acquainted with each other's equipment as the advance halted for the moment while the negotiations continued. The Shah was attempting to negotiate the removal of Soviet and British troops from the country in return for complying with the ultimatum to expel German citizens and their families. However, the Shah instead secretly allowed Germans to flee the country, sneaking them out under the British and Soviets' noses instead of allowing the military to take stock of the Germans they were expelling. This enraged the Soviets and British, and on September 16th, the Soviets were preparing to further invade from the north. With the attack imminent, the Shah abdicated the throne, and wealthy residents, fearing the communist army and a potential red purge, fled the city. The virtually leaderless state was now powerless to resist. And on September 17th, the Soviets had the honor of taking Tehran. The British Army was also given a presence in the city, and a joint military parade was held to commemorate the victory. The British and Soviets also restored the imperial state of Iran, legalizing each of their occupations under the Shah's leadership, with the new Shah being named as Mohammad Reza of Pahlavi. The British had initially wanted to restore the House of Qajar to the throne. However, the Pahlavi crown prince was a young man, much more popular than his father in Tehran, and a much more practical choice. At 4.30 p.m., Mohammad Reza Pahlavi was crowned as the King of Kings. The British and Soviets quickly signed agreements with the young Shah to maintain their military occupations of his country until six months after the end of the war. The areas under martial law of each army were to be reduced mainly to the border regions on the north and south, thus leaving out Tehran. However, each country was still allowed to exercise a sphere of influence and station military personnel throughout their entire half of the country, with the Soviets getting the north, including Tehran. So while Tehran was not included in the martial law area, it was heavily occupied by Soviet troops during the war. 
May 8, 1945, the war ended in Europe. However, the war in the Asia-Pacific region continued, and thus the status quo in Iran remained. On July 6th, the leader of Soviet Azerbaijan, Mir Jafar Bagirov, received a memorandum from the Central Committee of the Communist Party a.k.a. from Stalin and Company. Moscow ordered Baku to begin preparatory work for a national autonomous Azerbaijan district and to also develop separatist movements for other regions of northern Iran with Azeri populations while also trying to draw the Kurds of northwestern Iran into the separatist movement to form a national autonomous Kurdish district to create combat groups for defending the Soviets and their allies in the separatist movements and to create a social organization in Tabriz with branches in all regions of quote-unquote southern Azerbaijan and in Gilan. To establish an Azerbaijan Democratic Party with the objective of guiding this separatist movement. To publish a magazine and three newspapers for distribution in the new district and to commit the resources of the State Publishing House and the Foreign Trade Office to enabling these publications. A week later, the Soviet secret police, the NKVD, sent secret orders to its agents in and around Tabriz. As far as the Azerbaijani Democratic Party that had been called for, the NKVD recommended the transport of a certain Pishavari. They were, of course, talking about Saeed Jafar Pishavari. Pishavari was an ethnic Azeri from Iran. Back in 1921, when the NKVD's predecessor, the Cheka, staged a coup in Rasht against Mirza Kuchik Khan, the man they put in charge of the intelligence apparatus at that time was Jafar Pishavari. Because of this, he was arrested and imprisoned after Reza Shah Pahlavi had taken power. After nine years in jail, he was released by the Soviet forces in 1941 when they invaded. Pishavari had recently run for parliament on the ticket of the pro-Soviet Tudekh party, and he remained a trusted Azeri agent of the Soviets within Iran in the fall of 1945. The NKVD also ordered the Azerbaijani Democratic Party to hold ostensibly open discussions for members of the Tudekh party on joining the Azerbaijan Democratic Party. However, the end result was predetermined, and all the Tudekh members in Tabriz were signed up for the separatist party and to create local committees of this party not only in Tabriz but also in other major cities in northwestern Iran and the Caspian coast. To create organizing committees selecting from these supposedly authoritative democratic elements from the intelligentsia, middle class merchants, landowners and the clergy, but really this meant pro-Soviet elements. To use the resources provided by the Soviet state allocated in the previous document for the publication of the newspaper Voice of Azerbaijan out of Tabriz. And then go about organizing all of the agitation work via the press in Gilan and in Kurdistan as well, although this wouldn't end up happening in Gilan. And finally, the NKVD ordered that the separatist state would be based on the following dogmas. A. Redistribution of state land, including the Shah's personal property, plus financial compensation for peasants. B. Employing the workforce through massive public works projects. C. Improving public utilities. D. Improving public health. E. Using at least half of taxes for local needs. F. Equal rights for minorities and an end to the Shah's detribalization program, with schools and newspapers to be created using the local languages and G, court proceedings, including the gendarme and police activity in their local languages, plus using locals in the gendarme and police forces. On August 15, 1945, the Second World War ended, and immediately the Soviets began to organize local partisans and Tudek members. Because Japan hadn't officially surrendered yet, the clock was not ticking on the six-month deadline. However, the Soviets were getting prepared to act when that surrender did come. On September 2nd, the Japanese finally signed the surrender documents, starting the clock on the British and Soviets to evacuate Iran. However, the very next day, the Soviet agitation began. Jafar Pishavari formed the new Azerbaijan Democratic Party in Tabriz with himself as secretary and named Mohamed Biria as the head of the NKVD's new local Tabriz affiliate. No relation, by the way, to the head of the Soviet NKVD at this time, Lavrenti Beria. However, Biria's secret police had a similar terror streak in them. 
On October 1st, Beria organized the Azerbaijan Peasants Militia in Tabriz, formed out of Azeri peasants from the surrounding areas. By that date, the British only had 5,000 men left in Iran, most of them in the capital, and those set to withdraw before the March 2nd deadline. Meanwhile, the Soviets still had their full occupation force in Iran. The British made this decision to pressure the Soviets and, quote, give them no excuse on that score. On October 21st, Bagirov sent the following update to Lavrenti Beria in Moscow. Bagirov reported that 21 experienced NKVD operatives had been selected to liquidate people and organizations interfering with the development of the separatist state. These 21 were now going to be ordered to arm partisan detachments formed out of the local peasants. To help with this, 75 NKVD spies in northern Iran were selected to help coerce their comrades into joining the separatist militia. All the workers will be trained in Baku and will be sent first to Tabriz and then to other sites within mostly the Azerbaijan area at this point. That is, after all, why Baku was running the show on setting this whole thing up. On November 17th, Azeri partisans in Tabriz began to disarm the Shah's gendarme units. The Shah requested to move in the regular army, but the Soviet army denied the request to let them move. The Soviet interference was actively allowing the revolution to take place in Tabriz. And two days later, Pishavari and Biria staged a coup against the Shah's authorities in the city. The next day, Pishavari declared a separatist state, the Azerbaijan People's Government. Pishavari was named the president, with Biria named the, quote, Minister of Culture, although, again, despite not being the interior minister or the head of the secret police, that was his main job, and as the Minister of Culture, his job was to enforce the NKVD's goals. Pishavari, meanwhile, was the face of the regime, and the one who the Soviets constantly redirected the Shah's authorities to talk to on the matter. Pishavari named Azerbaijani as the official language of the state, and the use of the Persian Farsi language was banned. By December 14th, Pishavari and Beria's security forces had disarmed 6,000 of the Shah's troops and 3,000 gendarme units. With Kurdistan now an uncontrollable strip, it was ripe for the taking. And in the city of Mahabad on December 15th, the Kurdish People's Government was declared. The president was Qazi Mohammed. He was favored by the NKVD and been selected to lead the Kurdish Democratic Party of Iran, the separatist organizing body set up in this part of northern Kurdistan. Thus, with the British mostly evacuated and left blowing in the wind, the Soviets still had their full occupation force, plus they had partitioned the northwestern part of Iran. In fact, Stalin and Bagirov had discussed merging Prishavari's republic into the Soviet Union under Bagirov's Azerbaijani SSR. However, for now, both puppet republics remain very much like the communist states of Eastern Europe. On January 22nd, the Kurdish Republic changed its name to the Republic of Mahabad. And on January 30th, the United Nations Security Council issued its first warning on the issue, advising the Soviets to resolve their differences with Iran and make sure the puppet states were out of existence by March 2nd. As the deadline approached, the British had nearly withdrawn their entire force, while the Soviets had actually added more troops and now had sent weapons shipments to Tabriz to bolster the state of Jafar Peshavari against the Shah. In fact, the Soviets had sent over 11,000 rifles, 1,000 pistols, and various other assorted weapons, including thousands of grenades, to the Azeri separatists in Tabriz. Some munitions also made their way to Mahabad. And of course, the biggest factor was that the Red Army was still occupying the area. In fact, it hadn't evacuated from any part of northern Iran, including Tehran. As the March 2nd deadline hit, the British were finally out. Meanwhile, the Soviet troops remained through their entire sector and the weapons continued pouring across the Soviet border to Tabriz. The Soviets clearly had never intended to abide by the original agreement and now they were in an advantageous position along the Caspian. With the former British client in Iran neutralized by not only Red Army troops, but also losing a significant portion of its territory. By the end of the war, America had essentially taken over and assumed Britain's dominant position as the most powerful non-communist allied power. Now, with the communists causing predictable trouble, it wouldn't be the British making a big fuss, but the Americans, for the first time since the wartime alliance, loudly protesting the Soviet actions. With the Americans also assuming the British position as the main manipulator of the Shah's government.
that essentially made the two factions here opposing sides in the rapidly developing Cold War between America, Britain, and the Soviet Union, with the American and British client, Iran, being pressed by Soviet clients in Tabriz and Mahabad. However, despite the Americans' possession of the A-bomb and the Soviets not having it yet, the Soviet troops in control of the northern part of the country made launching any type of proxy war or attack impossible. Thus, this conflict played out like many in the Cold War during its later nuclear stage, through the media and in words. The same day, Ahmad Kavam, the Prime Minister of Iran, flew to Moscow. Kavam flew to meet directly with Stalin and Molotov, as he hoped to get directly to the heart of the issue by bypassing the Tabriz and Mahabad authorities that the Soviets had directed them to talk to. With the plane already in the air, the Soviets couldn't say no to the meeting, and always wanting to send the signal that they were doing the right thing, agreed to evacuate their garrisons in northeastern Iran. The Soviets also understood that the British and the Americans would not allow for the continued existence of this situation, and as such, they began softening up Peshavari for the inevitable betrayal. Bagirov, the head of the Azerbaijani SSR within the Soviet Union, came to Tabriz to inform Peshavari that the Soviets couldn't guarantee military support forever. However, at this point, the Soviets were holding out hope that the Azeris might be able to hold off the Iranians on their own, even without the Red Army's presence. During his trip, Bagirov took stock of the Azeri garrisons and reported to Stalin that he doubted their ability to hold off the Shah's forces. On the 18th, Iranian Prime Minister Kavam lodged a formal complaint with the United Nations Security Council, who then agreed to further discuss the issue, Soviet Union notwithstanding. The Soviet Union continued to push the limits of the United Nations policy, while as a member of the Security Council, still tried to appear to be acting in good faith. Thus, on the 24th, they withdrew their troops from Tehran and from northeastern Iran, while still maintaining the occupation of the Northwest. In addition to their satellite states, the Soviets also had troops stationed in Rasht, along with other areas of the Northwest that contained more minorities and less Persians. However, on the 26th, the Soviets informed Kavam that they intended to pull out completely. At the same time, the troops were still there and the United Nations Security Council was discussing the issue. On the 27th, America referred to Soviet foreign policy in the region as imperialistic and essentially claimed that the Soviet Union's anti-imperialist posturing was a lie. After this, Soviet diplomat Andrei Gromyko, with Stalin's blessing, walked out of the meeting. This was essentially a protest against two issues. One, the Soviets pointed out that the Americans and British were being imperialistic by manipulating the Shah's government to meddle in the situation, and they also took offense to the labeling of Soviet foreign policy as imperialistic. The walkout was the first moment of doubt in the new United Nations effectiveness. The next day, Begirov had another meeting with Peshavari in Tabriz, again advising him that the status quo was unsustainable, because for the Soviet Union to legitimize their anti-imperialist claims, they would not be able to keep troops in territory claimed by the Shah. From this perspective, it appeared that Britain and America had the Soviets boxed in with little to no confidence in the ability of either republic to stand on its own and hold off Iranian forces, the Soviets shifted to a strategy in which they hoped the rebels would come to a deal to reincorporate themselves into Iran and thereby exert Soviet influence within the Iranian government. Moscow now viewed this as the best case outcome. The Soviet backing of the separatists pushed the Shah's government unintentionally further into British and American hands. So the idea was now to use the former rebels to push the Shah's government back in a pro-Soviet direction. On April 4th, Resolution No. 3 was passed by the United Nations Security Council, this time gently requesting that the Soviets remove their troops. The Soviets again showed public belligerence by boycotting the vote, which actually helped the Soviets cover up their true intentions, with Stalin intentionally heating up the situation only to cool it off himself once the troops inevitably pulled out. However, Peshavari held out hope that this was a form of Soviet backing in the United Nations, an organization that neither republic was invited to. The other reason Peshavari may have thought he had more Soviet backing was because on the 8th, four days later, the Soviet Union signed a treaty of friendship with the Azerbaijan People's Government. As thousands turned out in Tabriz, forced or otherwise, to celebrate the agreement, there were natural roots to the independence movement, so not everything can assume to be propaganda, and at this point the movement was still relatively popular. However, behind Peshavari's back, the Soviets were once again negotiating with Kavam. 
Kavam agreed to give oil concessions to the Soviets in northern Iran in return for the Soviet withdrawal. Despite the fact that the contract with the Anglo-Iranian oil company stipulated that the oil be drawn from wells in the southern part of the country, the British were still very unhappy with the potential Soviet arrangement. However, the Americans were fine with it as it guaranteed that Soviet troops would be out of the country. The Red Army no longer fortified the whole border of the Mahabad Republic, and it subsequently entered into a military alliance with Tabriz. Iran started to move their troops to try to take advantage and push the Kurds back to Mahabad city. However, standing in their way were the Kurdish Peshmerga, made up of normally rival tribal militias in cooperation with each other, under the leadership of Qazi Muhammad, ready to fight the Iranians. On April 29th, the Iranians attacked the Battle of Karabad. However, despite air power and superior armor, the Iranians were defeated by the Kurdish troops. To secure their position, the Kurds had to fight off further Iranian attacks over the next few days before a temporary ceasefire was signed on May 3rd. On May 8th, the United Nations Security Council passed Resolution No. 5, deferring further action on the Iran crisis until the Iranians could give a report, while also maintaining the refusal to recognize or even invite the two republics. Also on May 8th, Stalin wanted to make the situation crystal clear to Peshavari, despite his previous two meetings with Bagirov. Stalin sent him a personal letter explaining that Soviet troops would eventually need to leave Iran, for the first time in over a year referring to the Tabriz area as part of Iran writing to Peshavari that there was no such situation as there was in Russia during their revolutions, that he didn't doubt that the Tabrizis could win with continued Soviet support, but that Soviet support could not continue without undercutting the Soviets' image as liberators. Furthermore, Stalin added that the British and Americans had, quote, said to us, if Soviet troops can stay in Iran, then why can't British troops also stay in Syria, Egypt, Indonesia, and Greece, or American troops stay in China, Iceland, or Denmark? Therefore, we decided to withdraw troops from Iran and Manchuria in order to unleash the liberation movement, a.k.a. communist movements, in the colonies. In other words, Stalin was actually telling Peshavari that Soviet help for his movement actually was a hindrance to it in the international arena, citing the Red Army's presence as an example of why his republic didn't receive diplomatic recognition. Stalin then added bluntly that to continue to go against the Shah's government would be to, quote, spit on everything to break with Kavan and therefore ensure a victory for the Anglophile reactionaries. Stalin, if you couldn't tell, was now very committed to his deal with Kavam and was now confident about turning the Tehran government in a pro-Soviet direction. Kavam was then invited to Moscow to meet with Molotov and other Soviet officials once again, where Molotov agreed to push Peshavari into talks with Kavam. With further Soviet pressure, the two sides negotiated and agreed to terms and principle. However, the deal was forced upon Peshavari and was half-hearted on his part, as he still wanted nothing to do with this idea. Well, if Tabriz and Peshavari were a source of annoyance to the Soviets, Mahabad was another extension of that. The Soviets, while keeping them alive by buying their entire tobacco crop, urged them to merge into the Tabriz government, while also abandoning the Red Army's direct presence in the area. For now, that didn't matter because the ceasefire agreement was still in place. However, it wasn't long before Iran took full advantage of the situation to break it, defeating the Kurds at the Battle of Mameh Shah and driving them back to the outskirts of Mahabad city. By the end of the month, the Soviets had pulled all of their troops out of Iran. At this point, both states were becoming quite unpopular, with their leaders coming to be viewed as tools of the Soviets, who weren't the most popular in the region after their starvation rations during the war, plus the fear merchants had of their communist policies. Certainly, the Barzani tribe was viewed by the other Kurdish tribes as being favored by the Soviets. While in Azerbaijan, Beria's secret police was viewed as unnecessarily violent and repressive, and just an extension of the iron-fisted control exercised by Lavrenti Beria and the NKVD, infamous, of course, around the world for their terror. Molotov and Kavam continued their discussions for a pro-Soviet Tudek government, which the Soviets felt confident was going to happen now that they had pulled troops out. 
In addition to just the oil concessions, the Iranian government adopted other more pro-Soviet policies, and also Kavam temporarily involved more pro-Soviet Tudek members. The British, who had of course contested control over Iran, with the Soviets and the Russians before them for many years, now felt the country slipping away. But the Americans were not going to allow that to happen as they encouraged the Shah and Kavam to resist Soviet pressure. The Shah explicitly agreed to hold firm. By the end of October, the Shah had broken with the pro-Soviet faction that Kavam had organized, which he had, of course, done at the Shah's request at that time, mind you. Kavam now called for decisive action against the Soviet client states, proposing nationwide elections, including in Tabriz and Mahabad. The election law was to be enforced and implemented by the Iranian gendarme units. However, Peshavari's own units would not let the Shah's men through. The elections, scheduled for December, were fast approaching. And now Kavam did side with the Shah, advising the Americans that he would break with the pro-Soviet faction he had organized and that his Iranian Democratic Party would support the invasion of Tabriz as soon as possible. On December 4th, the Iranian offensive began. By the 10th, they had made significant progress. However, horror stories followed in their wake. The American judge, William O. Douglas, later wrote about the Iranian offensive, writing that following the capture of territory, speaking or writing in the Azerbaijani language was banned. The beards of traditional peasants would be burned off. Some peasants were outright murdered. Their wives and daughters were often raped. Some houses were plundered and burned, and numerous livestock were stolen, both systematically and by individual gendarme units. With his state collapsing around him, Peshavari was pressured by the Soviets to follow the previous agreement he had made with Kavam, while venting that the agreement brought to mind the Gilan events of 1920. Remember, Peshavari had worked in the administration of the then Persian Soviet Republic. Peshavari continued, our revolutionary comrades were deceived by the Soviets, and reactionaries were allowed to gradually launch repressions against them. Many of them had to emigrate. History will repeat itself. Peshavari was in effect drawing a direct parallel between the Soviet abandonment of their Rasht allies in 1921 with their abandonment of their Tabriz allies here in 1946. And Peshavari, being in both governments, did indeed see history repeat itself. The Shah's forces made significant inroads on the 11th, and on that day, amidst the chaos, Peshavari received a second personal letter from Stalin. Stalin, hearing about Peshavari's complaints, was much more direct this time about the Soviet's position. The Man of Steel told Peshavari that as Prime Minister of Iran, Kavam had the right to send troops to any part of the country, Azerbaijan being no exception. This statement right here is essentially telling Peshavari that Stalin no longer viewed the Tabriz area as anything other than part of Iran. This was, of course, a betrayal and a straight-up about-face, but it's not as if Peshavari wasn't given any advance warning. In case his point wasn't quite clear, Stalin added that continued armed resistance would be useless, pointless, and unprofitable. And he told Peshavari straight up, announce that you have nothing against the presence of governmental troops, and that you'll accept and participate in the call for elections. And to say that you're doing it, quote, for the unity of the Iranian people. Now, referring to the Azeri separatists as the Iranian people very much signaled the end of any Soviet support. Seeing the writing on the wall, Peshavari resigned, and along with most of his cabinet and his party, fled to the Soviet Union. Despite being allowed into the Soviet Union, Peshavari did die less than a year later in a car accident while living in Baku. However, no connections to the NKVD, to the Iranian Secret Service, or to any other intelligence service has ever been made. At Bagirov's request, the Soviets opened the border and allowed Azeri refugees fleeing the Iranian army to start streaming in. Hundreds of Azeris per day crossed over and resettled in the Soviet Union, especially those from Tabriz. The next day, the Shah's troops captured the city, and continuing their harsh reprisals, approximately 421 Azeris died, most of them civilians. Meanwhile, cynical as they were, the Soviet Union didn't really care that civilians were dying in Tabriz, mainly due to their use of the Azeri people like pawns. What the Soviets were focused on at this time was securing that oil concession. And as soon as they heard that the Shah's troops had recaptured Tabriz, the Soviets started applying pressure that the Iranian government should obey and ensure the execution of the April 4th oil agreement. When they received no reply, the Soviet ministers in Moscow began getting nervous. 
Meanwhile, the Shah's troops had moved south and were now closing in on Mahabad. On December 15th, they captured the Kurdish stronghold. The teaching of the Kurdish language was banned, and the Iranians even had a book burning for Kurdish language literature. Qazi Mohammed had not fled to the Soviet Union and instead was captured and imprisoned by the Iranian gendarme. The same day, in Tehran, the Shah's parade force was holding a commemoration ceremony for the victory in Tabriz and the reincorporation of the city into Iran. By December 19th, the situation in both republics was desperate. The final refugees were making their way into the Soviet Union, approximately 5,800 Azeris, Kurds, and other minorities having fled since December 12th. The next day, the Iranians finally captured all of the territory and immediately began holding military tribunals for officers and officials of the former republics, most of whom were tortured and or executed. At the same time, Kavam, under British and American pressure, stalled in his commitment to the Soviet oil deal, finally replying to the Kremlin saying he would set up the treaty once all the necessary conditions were met. However, he sent this on the day that it appeared the necessary conditions were met, that being Iran's recovery of its pre-war territory. The Soviets were left baffled and wondering what the necessary conditions were, as many began to suspect that British and American pressure was going to prevent the concession from happening after all. Those weren't the only promises that the Shah was backing off. On December 31st, the day the elections were finally going to be held, the Shah backed off his promises for electoral reforms and for Tabrizi autonomy. The elections, which many suspected were rigged, were dominated by pro-British candidates, throwing the Soviet oil deal further into doubt. On March 20th, the Barzani Kurds clashed with the Shah's troops outside Nalas. Despite the loss of their state, the Kurds were going to keep on fighting, especially the Barzani tribe, Barzan being a cross-border region between Iran and Iraq. The Kurds took an Iranian general's son hostage, which kept the militants safe as it prevented air raids, with Iran trying to avoid any harm to the general's son. This was also an area in which the Kurds were at a big disadvantage, so it worked two ways. On March 30th, the former leader of the Kurdish People's Government, Qazi Mohammed, was tried, along with his brother. American diplomat and intelligence officer Archie Roosevelt Jr. had American ambassador to Iran, George Allen, urgently request that the Shah not execute Qazi or his brother, excusing their collaboration with the Soviets as simple political expediency. The Shah told Allen, quote, Are you afraid I'm going to have them shot? If so, you can rest your mind. I am not. Technically true to his word, the next day, the Shah had the two publicly hanged in Mahabad. This prompted Kurdish outrage, and it also prompted Roosevelt Jr. to remark that the Shah had likely ordered the brother's execution, quote, as soon as our ambassador had closed the door behind him, and adding that he wasn't one of the Shah's personal fans. Despite the relative success, at this point the Kurds were simply guerrilla fighters and seeing the handwriting on the wall, they attempted to smuggle their weaponry into Iraq. But after clashing with the pro-British Iraqi authorities, they re-engaged the Iranians who they knew would give them trouble. Yet they had to pass through Iranian territory to get to the Soviet Union, who had offered them asylum. The Kurds had to fight their way past Iranian troops, sometimes keeping them away by ambushing their supply columns. On June 18th, the long journey was finally over and the Barzani Kurds reached the River Aras, crossing into the Soviet Union. Meanwhile, by August 1st, the elections process had been finalized. Kavam's moderates were held down, but his pro-British candidates won a majority, with the legitimacy of this election again thrown somewhat into question. However, Kavam's pro-British candidates were even less likely than his moderates to approve the Soviet oil concession, and the deal was officially cancelled by the end of August. Stalin was absolutely furious but there was nothing he could do as his troops were already out of the country. Plus, the Americans and the British had diplomatic mastery over Iran, making a pro-Soviet coup in the country nearly impossible to pull off. Meanwhile, in Tehran, the opposition to Kavam was happy about rejecting the Soviet oil deal, but they were enraged at the Shah and Kavam for breaking their election reform promises. A series of protest movements over these issues began. The name of the man leading the opposition? Mohammad Mossadegh. And this is, of course, the part where the story becomes well-told and well-known. But hopefully this adds a little bit of background for the next time you hear the Mossadegh story. And hopefully this provides a little bit of context for the next time you hear about Berlin or Korea and the start of the Cold War.
So thank you for watching, especially if you watched it all the way through. I hope it was informative, entertaining, and most of all, I hope you learned something. We've got more great content on the way, so be sure to like, subscribe, share, and Patreon. Thanks again for watching. I'm Alex. I'm out.